crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. Rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his wandering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, yes. who triumphed o'er the grave, Amen. who rose victorious yes. to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, yes. who died eternal life to and lives that death may die. Yes. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him given from his eternal throne. To thee be endless praise, for thou for us hast died. Be thou, O Lord, through endless days, adored and magnified. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Church, that's what we're here for. We're here to crown him, uh, worship him, to honor him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive and well this morning. And uh, praise the Lord for uh, his resurrection from the grave. Amen. Thank you so much for that wonderful song. Well, if you'll open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And we're going to be looking at verse 1 down through verse number 11 for our text today. And uh, I'll be turning to several other passages of Scripture also. So you may want to uh, be a good idea to keep your Bible uh, open. And, uh, and, and try to turn, look at, at a number of passages of Scripture. But our text will be found here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 15 this morning. And so if you found that, let's do stand together and honor the reading of the Word of God, the public reading of God's Word. We'll read the text from verse 1 down through verse 11. Then we'll pray once again and, and see what the Lord has for our teaching and our understanding uh, this morning. We're thinking today about the essence of, of the gospel, the essence of the gospel. Verse number one of First Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul writes and says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that are not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. 
Therefore, whether, uh, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the Word of God this morning. And we thank you for how you've already blessed us with our good time of fellowship and of worship, the good congregational singing. Uh, Lord, the wonderful, special song uh, that blessed our hearts this morning. Lord, you've been so good to us today. And we thank you so much for all of your blessings. Lord, we pray now that you would bless us with uh, your presence, that through the preaching of the Word of God and by the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we could be drawn closer to you, that we could learn more of you. And Lord, we would pray once again, as we would always pray, that souls can be saved and lives would be changed and that revival will come. We'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, we humbly pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. May be seated. We're talking about the essence of the gospel this morning. And this passage of scripture, that is 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, it is really oftentimes considered uh, the defining verses in the Bible for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And especially those first four verses, verse one down through uh, verse number four, uh, really more especially carries that distinction. But as you study the entire chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know, oftentimes it's been said about this chapter, it is called the resurrection chapter. The whole chapter is about resurrection. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's about the resurrection of those who know Christ as Savior and who follow Christ uh, in, their, in, in our lives. And so it's a wonderful chapter. We're going to be studying it again this evening in our evening service. We're looking at the beginning of it this morning. We'll look at the end of it, the closing verses uh, in our evening service uh, tonight. But in thinking about this thought of the essence of the gospel, you'll notice how in verse number one and verse number two, a couple of things stand out. One is Paul makes a declaration in the first verse where he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. He makes a declaration. And then in verse number two, uh, it looks to me like he gives a directive. He gives a directive. He said, By which also ye are saved. And so he's talking about the gospel, the gospel that he preached, the gospel that that, that they receive, the gospel upon which they stand, the gospel by which alone can save man from, from his sins, amen. He makes a directive here, he says, it's by this gospel uh, by which also ye are saved. He says, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, let me just point out to you that those who believed in vain would be those that Jesus described Back in Matthew chapter number 7, you remember verse 21 down through verse 23 where Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name uh, done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so when Jesus describes uh, people in these verses, I think he's describing those that Paul uh, mentions in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as those that would have believed in vain. And you know, it's a sad truth, that, but there are people even still today that have believed in vain. That is, they've gotten some religion, and Matthew chapter 7 describes people that have religion, that even pursue religious activities and, and accomplish religious things. But yet Jesus said to them, I, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that uh, work iniquity. I, I think that would be the people that would fit that. And so Paul says in his directive, his declaration about the gospel that he has preached, uh, that we receive and that we stand upon, and he says the directive of the gospel is it's by this gospel of Jesus Christ that you're saved. Uh, 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 unless uh, you've gone some other way, you've believed in vain, but if you have believed it, if you've truly believed it and you received it and you stand upon it, 
This is the gospel. This is the preaching. This is the message by which a man is saved from their sins. And, and the thing about it is, it is only the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, by which men can be saved by receiving it, by believing it, by standing on it. And I think that's why Paul the Apostle would write in, in Romans chapter number 1, in verse 15, he writes to the Romans and he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And in verse 16 he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was convinced that this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ was the, was the only thing uh, by which men, women, boys and girls could be saved, have their sins forgiven, justified in God's eyes, uh, having the opportunity to truly become the children of God and, and secure that promise of eternal life by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul believed it was this gospel. And so uh, in this resurrection chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, we begin by thinking about the essence of the gospel. And it involves three things, if you follow along in the outline in your, in your bulletin. It follows these three things. First of all, his death in verse number three. And then also his burial in verse number four. And his resurrection in verse number four also. You see, the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ is those three things. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. Without the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, there's no gospel. There's no gospel message. And, and let me add to that, without the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul himself, I believe the way that he writes here, would be the first one to admit. And, and in fact, if you follow the study throughout the chapter in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says things like, if there's no resurrection, our faith is in vain. He says things like, if there's no resurrection, our preaching is in vain. And so Paul makes the emphasis here that, look, it's this gospel of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we preach. That's what we stand on. And if there was no death, burial, and resurrection, there'd be no gospel. If there's no death, burial, and resurrection, there'd be nothing to preach. If there's no death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'd be nothing to stand on. If there's no death, burial, and resurrection uh, of the Lord Jesus, there'd be, there'd be no hope for us at all. No chance of being made right with God, being justified in God's sight and having uh, the forgiveness of our sins and the promise of everlasting life. And so you see what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you see here that it all really is determined upon those three things, death, burial, and resurrection. That's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is not just a way of religion. The gospel is not a philosophy of men to follow. Uh, the gospel is not a, uh, simply a story, uh, though we call it, and they call it in the movie, the greatest story ever told. The gospel is not just that. We need to realize this is what the gospel is and, and the very essence of it, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today we just want to look at those three things. First of all, his death in verse number three. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ begins uh, with, with His death. It, that, that's the reason that He came. He came as, of course, the Christmas story, the coming of Christ, born of the Virgin and being birthed in the, in, the, in, in the stable there in Bethlehem uh, is a wonderful story as well. And, and we might, in a sense, say, well, the gospel begins there. Well, it begins there in the understanding of the coming of the Son of God to the earth. But what was the reason for His coming? He came to die. The reason He was born and laid in a cradle was that ultimately He would be nailed to a cross. 
that, that, that was his whole purpose. He would go from Bethlehem to, uh, to Jerusalem to Calvary. And, and, and so, uh, yes, you could say that, well, the, the overall story starts uh, with his birth in Bethlehem, but the real essence of what it's all about, it really begins with his death. Uh, it's his death. Uh, it, and a couple of things about it. it. This was the reason that he came. He came for the purpose to die uh, as a payment for man's sins. But notice a couple of things about his death as I been really uh, praying and contemplating this thought about the essence of the gospel over this past uh, week or so. One of the things about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ that kind of comes to my mind and in my heart is that when you look at it, when you look at the, the overall account of the, uh, of the gospel story, you'll see that his death was managed personally. It was managed personally. And by that, I simply mean that we must understand there's no accident about it. In fact, you really can't even say that it was murder. You really can't even say that there is any murder involved in it. I mean, we people think of it that way, I'm sure. They think that, well, he was murdered by the Jews or by the Romans, and they, they, they nailed the spikes into his hands and his feet, and they put him on the cross, and they put him to death, they crucified him, they, uh, they, they killed him. But the thing about it is, when you study the, the whole account, the whole story of the gospel, you'll find out that Jesus was in control all the way. He was in control of it all along. There, there was nothing that was just a sad coincidence or a happening. There was nothing that, uh, that you could say, well, this really should not have happened. There might be somebody that would say that. Well, it really shouldn't have happened. He was innocent, and uh, he certainly did not deserve to be uh, put to death. You know, the thing about it is, when he realized that all of this was God's plan, and that Jesus Christ, even on the earth, he was in control of it all. After all, what are we talking about here? We're talking about his gospel, amen? His gospel. It's all his doing. It's all his plan. It was managed personally. Jesus managed this thing. Jesus is the one that brought it to fruition. Jesus is the one that brought it through. He was in control of it all. In fact, we can understand that, I think, when we look at John's gospel account in chapter 10. And in John chapter number 10, and just a couple of two or three verses there, uh, verse number uh, 11 especially in John chapter 10 Jesus said this I am the good shepherd the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep notice that phrase giveth his life it, it wasn't stolen from him wasn't taken from him no he says very plainly that he gave it he's the good shepherd and as a good shepherd he, he gives his life for the sheep in verse 27 and verse 28 of that same chapter in John chapter number uh, 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And so Jesus said he's a good shepherd that giveth his life for the sheep, and then he says here in verse number 28 that for his sheep that follow him, those that follow him, so he'd be talking about each of us uh, who have trusted Christ as our Savior. He says, I give them eternal life. You see, it's, 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 it's all in his control. It all has to do with his giving. It's, it's what he is doing. In Matthew chapter uh, number uh, 16, Matthew chapter uh, 16. Well, let me give you something else in John chapter uh, 10. Uh, also, you can see here verse 17, verse 18. Therefore doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of my, myself. I have power to lay it down have, uh, and I have power to take it again. And so, he, uh, again, he's in control, isn't he? And he's got the power to do all of this. And he's the one that gives eternal life to, to those that would uh, follow him. And then you have Matthew chapter number 16 also. 
And in Matthew chapter 16, if you would recall, this is the account where Peter makes that statement, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, makes that confession. And, uh, and, and, and then in verse 20 of Matthew 16, Jesus charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was uh, Jesus the Christ. And he said, well, why is that? Well, it wasn't quite time yet uh, for it to be revealed. It, it, it really, God was not meant uh, it's not meant for it to be revealed until until his death and following his death is resurrection. And so in verse 21, if, you, if you're looking there in Matthew chapter number 16, in verse 21, it tells us there, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and notice words, be killed and raised again the third day. Jesus was already teaching his disciples. He was headed to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he would be killed. He would suffer death. He would be crucified. He would be put to death. And so Jesus is already telling them this. And you know, the thing about it is, this is not the only time and the only place. You see it in several other places, really, uh, in, in, the, in the gospel accounts. In, uh, ver in, the, in that same chapter in Matthew, in Matthew, or the next chapter actually, Matthew chapter 17, over in verse 22 and verse 23, the Bible says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, that, so that is to his disciples once again, Jesus said unto them, the Son of Man, and he's referring to himself, you, you know from your study, he liked to call himself that. He was the Son of God, but he, was, but he identified with man by, uh, by the incarnation, being clothed in human flesh. And so he's the son of God. He's the son of man. And, uh, and so he says, the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And, and then uh, Matthew said, and they were exceeding uh, uh, sorry. That is, the disciples, this was something that really kind of disturbed them. You really get the understanding, the thought that uh, it, it takes them quite a while uh, for to catch on uh, with what Jesus was teaching them about, about his coming death. And then in Matthew chapter number 20, Matthew chapter 20 and verse uh, 17 and reading down through verse number 19, here's, here's another time. It says, And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. And that's just in Matthew. Three, time, three different occasions, three different times, Jesus instructs his disciples, tells his disciples that the day is going to come that he is going to be put to death. He is going to be crucified. This was no surprise. This was something that it should not have been a surprise to his disciples because he told them this is what's going to happen over and over again. He says, that's where I'm headed. That's where we're going. That's what's going to happen. And so you see, in all of this, Jesus is in control, isn't he? He's managing this, the whole story, the whole thing. And, 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 and when it came to the time of his death on the cross, even, in uh, John chapter number 19, John chapter 19, when he was on the cross, I'll read a little bit there in John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And then notice this, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And that simply means that he died. But notice, he didn't die until he said, it is finished. The work that he came to do to accomplish on the cross of Calvary, which is to be the, the, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, which is to be the sacrifice on behalf of man to pay the penalty of man's sins. He says, it, it's, it's all completed now. It's all been finished. And so then it says, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And, and notice something interesting here in John 19 as it continues, the Jews therefore, verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation 
uh, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. This has to do with the Passover week. And it says that, that they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, they, they wanted to break the legs of Jesus and of the other two that were on the other crosses on each side of them. They wanted to break their legs so that it would speed up their death. That was the purpose of it. And, and so then it says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record. And this would be referring to John himself. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that, uh, that he saith uh, truth, uh, knoweth that, that he saith truth, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone shall not, uh, a bone of him shall not be broken. And then, and again, another scripture saith, they shall uh, look on him whom they pierced. And, and so uh, the interesting thing is, he didn't die until he said it was finished. The other two had not died. They had to break their legs to speed up their, the death process. But Jesus died of his own accord. That's what we need to see here. Jesus died of his, of, of his, of his own doing, if you will. Uh, of, his own, uh, of his own volition. Of his own choice. He uh, said it is finished. And then he gave up the ghost and, and, and he died. In uh, uh, Mark chapter number 14, Mark chapter 14, and, uh, uh, or Mark 15 rather, Mark chapter 15, and, and pick up some reading with verse number 42. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor who also waited for the kingdom of God and went uh, and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled. See, here's, here's more evidence of, of how Jesus was in control of all that would happen. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. In other words, Pilate thought, well, how could he already be dead? And uh, calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had any... Uh, had been any while dead and when he knew of it the centurion uh, of the centurion he gave the body to Joseph and so he, he, even Pilate and Pilate understand that Roman governor that, that knew all about the intricacies of crucifixion he would have a good idea of, of usually what would be the average time for someone to die uh, when crucified on the cross and so even Pilate uh, wondered about this thing and thought about this thing. He, he marveled that, that Jesus was already dead. He wasn't expecting to hear that. Uh, you see, the thing about it is Pilate or nobody else was in control of this thing. Nobody else was managing this thing. Jesus himself managed his death personally. And so it was managed personally. Something else I thought about uh, that the Bible teaches, I believe, is this. And that is when it comes to his death, it was, it was made for a propitiation. Made for a propitiation. And you can see this in Romans chapter number 3, as well as some scripture in John's writing in 1 John as well. But in Romans chapter 3 and verse number uh, 25. Uh, you know, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. A propitiation through His blood. Propitiation simply means... We use the term atoning sacrifice, and that's, that's a good way to think of it. But what we must understand is this. Uh, God has always been against sin. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 in the Old Testament, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
In the New Testament, Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is, is death. Uh, death came into the world by, by sin through Adam's transgression uh, in, the, in the garden in the, in, in the beginning. And, and so propitiation means that which will satisfy the requirement. The requirement was death. The penalty was death. The wrath of God had to be atoned for. The wrath of God had to be satisfied. Jesus' blood was that which satisfied the wrath of God. So he, 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 his death made for a propitiation. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see again that Jesus is the one managing this all the way through. His, uh, uh, it, it, he did it personally, but it's made for a propitiation. In the text in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 15, Paul the apostle said that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, for our sins. And so propitiation the sac uh, sacrifice. Back over in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, you remember the verses and they apply here. Verse number four and following, surely he hath borne our griefs and, cover and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded, listen, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what was laid upon Jesus on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was the one and the only one who absolutely knew no sin at all, but on the cross as, as his death would be made for a propitiation. You see, the understanding is, as Isaiah prophesied, all of my sins, all of your sins, all of our transgressions, all of our uh, failing to follow God's law, uh, 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 all of it was put on him on the cross. That was the cup that we looked at recently when we studied uh, the event of Gethsemane and, 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 and Jesus' prayer there in that garden. And so you see, in this essence of the gospel, it begins with the death uh, of Christ and, and his death was something that he managed personally. He was in control of it all the way through. There's no accident. It was not something that, that, uh, uh, that, they, that, that they just did. And, and it was made for a propitiation. There's a reason for it. And that is as the substitute, as a sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath against your sin and against my sin, whereby we could be saved and justified in God's sight whereby we could receive the promise of eternal life. That's his death. But then the second part is his burial. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, the beginning of the verse there, the A part, and that he was buried. And that he was buried. Let me give you two things that, that, that I've thought about concerning this. First of all, understand about his burial that it was factual. It was factual. There's a fact to it. Uh, there, there's, uh, we know that it happened. It, it was arranged for, the Bible describes, by a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. And, and we, can, we can look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And uh, these verses beginning with verse 57. I'll read down through verse 60. But in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57, when the even was come, there came a rich man of, of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his own new tomb, 
which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door upon the sepulcher and departed. And so you see, the burial was, was a factual thing. It was something that was arranged for by this particular man, this Joseph of Arimathea. You know, it, it, we, we enjoy saying uh, uh, about the death of Christ and his resurrection from the tomb that, uh, that he was laid in a borrowed tomb, don't we? That it was Joseph's tomb. That's what the Bible says. It wasn't Jesus's tomb. But you know, and, and that, that's, that's a good way to think of it, that it was a borrowed tomb because he only needed it for three days, amen. Third day, he'd be, uh, he would rise again. But there's something a little bit more interesting when you really think about how this burial was arranged. This man, Joseph of Arimathea, he was, the Bible describes him, he was a wealthy man, he was a rich man. Now, he was a, he was a religious man as well. He was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. But he was one who believed on Christ. He believed Jesus. Uh, he, had a, he had a partner uh, in this whose name was Nicodemus. And, and there's an account in John's gospel of Nicodemus along with Joseph of Arimathea taking the body of Jesus down from the cross and the two men working together to place him into that, into that tomb. And so if, if we really think about it, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, a wealthy man, he, he did not live in Jerusalem. He lived in another community, in another place. He lived in Arimathea. And so when you really think about it, you have to think about this. This tomb that Joseph, Joseph purchased the place for, hewn it out, had it cut out of the, of the hillside there in, in, in that place. Interesting thing is it was near Golgotha. It was near the cross. And the Bible describes that there's a garden there also. And you know the accounts of the resurrection when, when uh, uh, Mary had come and, and uh, they, they didn't recognize Jesus in that one account following his resurrection. They thought he was the gardener. There, there's a garden there. We, we call it the garden tomb. And, and even today they refer to it over in Israel as, as Joseph's tomb or as the garden tomb. That's what the Jews referred to it there. You may have seen that. The garden tomb, the Joseph's tomb was on the news just recently, just this past week, as vandals, Palestinian uh, people, Arabs, uh, Muslims there, vandalized uh, the garden tomb, Joseph's tomb, where, where Jesus was laid. It's in that area where you can see the rock structure that looks like the face of a skull. Calvary, the hill of Calvary, was called Golgotha, which means in the Hebrew, uh, the place of the skull. And that's where this tomb was at. Why would you suppose that a rich man that lived in another community uh, would, uh, would want to uh, buy a piece of land and, and build a tomb for himself in a place like that, <laughs> in, in, outside of Jerusalem and in that place by the, uh, where they crucified people on Calvary? Uh, no, really, it looks like this was something and I think it's, it's really a better way to think of it. This was something that Joseph and I think Nicodemus in on it with him. It's something that they did in advance in preparation for a burial place for Jesus. I think the location of it gives evidence of that. I think the fact that the Bible describes uh, uh, Joseph as a follower of Christ even though in another place it, it says that he, he, he actually did so secretly because he was in that Sanhedrin. But also we have the accounts of both Joseph and, 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 and Nicodemus. They would take odds at the, at, with the decision of that council to put Jesus to death. They, they weren't for it. You say, well, where did all that come about? Well, I don't have time to go and look at it, but I, I would encourage you to go back and read John chapter 3 again when the man named Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And when Jesus, and when Nicodemus said to him, uh, uh, Lord, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no other man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Remember what Jesus said? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
And you continue and read in John chapter 3, and you read that wonderful account, how Jesus describes what the new birth is all about. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man, how, how is that possible? How can a man be born again? How, can, does he enter his uh, mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus said, no, no, no. He says, I'm talking about something that's spiritual here. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I, I, I'm not talking about your physical birth. I'm talking about a second birth. That's what he's teaching Nicodemus. And then, you know, sometimes we read that passage of Scripture and, and we think that, um, that, that it just ends there. But, you know, the interesting thing is you go back and you don't really see an ending. You don't really see the indication of Nicodemus going on on his way. And, and the Scripture continues on with Jesus come to the point of John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and Jesus went on and said in that, in that passage also that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, Son of God, be lifted up. I think Nicodemus and then his friend Joseph that very early on, they got an understanding that Jesus was going to Calvary, that Jesus would be lifted up. This, this was not going to be a surprise to them. And so it would have taken a number of months to have cut out that, that tomb and have it ready. And then the other thing that's interesting is how that Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate so quickly after the death of Jesus. I think we might could suppose if you want to just do some imagining. I, I like to imagine how it might have been by when I read the scripture. Joseph may very well have been at that tomb and in that garden as Jesus was nailed to that cross. Waiting and watching for the signs for the understanding that he had died because it really seems that he's gone to Pilate quickly to uh, receive the body of Jesus. For one thing, we saw in the text that Pilate marveled that Jesus was already dead. Didn't, didn't even think he'd already be, been dead. Joseph had already come, told him, look, he's dead and we, we, we want his body to put it in the tomb. I don't know about you, but when I study that, I just got to thinking that it, it really makes the whole scene seem even more special but especially i think we have to say it makes it so factual when we see that that a man like this like joseph not like nicodemus would do such a thing he was buried and not only was it factual but i believe it was evidenced as well it was evidenced in matthew chapter number uh, 27 again we already looked there uh, once, but in Matthew chapter 27 and uh, picking up with verse 61. Verse 61. In um, uh, Matthew chapter 27 and, uh, well, no, verse 60. It's back up to verse number uh, 60. He laid it in his own tomb, which is hewn out, out of the rock and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And then as it continues in verse 61, notice, and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver, they're talking about Jesus, said while he was yet alive after three days, I'll rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Two things here. This, his burial, not only is fact, uh, factual, with the understanding of these two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, arranging for the burial. But it was evidence. Because the day that Jesus was placed in the tomb, you had, for one thing, you have, have Mary Magdalene and the other Mary 
sitting over against the sepulchre. In other words, they're there. They're observing. They're watching. Uh, there's that, they're, it, it, it's being evidenced. And then not only that, but the next day you have the chief priests and the Pharisees. They go to Pilate. They, they say, look, we, we, we need a seal. and We need a watch. We need some guards there at, at the tomb. And, and so Pilate gives it, gives it to them. And you can see two understandings about the seal. For one thing, uh, that undoubtedly would have been like the seal of Caesar saying, you know, hands off, you know, uh, no trespassing, that sort of thing. The Roman guards were there. But also, it car I think it carries the idea that it, in however way they did it, they, they sealed that tomb. Whatever they would have used, some kind of mortar or something, they, they, they sealed it up. And, uh, and they set the guards there. And so you see, it, it's, the thing about his burial is, not only is it factual with the arrangement of it with Joseph and with Nicodemus, but it's evidenced by Mary Magdalene and the other Mary there, and, and then by even by the Pharisees and by the Romans and by Pilate. They, they, set, they sealed it and they set a guard there. It, it, his burial is evidence. And he was buried. Then his resurrection in verse number four. Talk about the essence of the gospel and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Let me try to tell you two more things about uh, here and two things about the resurrection, uh, if I could quickly. First of all, would you take note that it was powerful? It was, in fact, powerful. If you were to look back to uh, Matthew chapter number uh, 28, Matthew chapter 28, and let me just read it. it. It'll just take a little bit of time, but let me let me just read it. I think it's good for us to read it. Matthew 28, beginning with verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. That's just a Bible way for the way we say, hey, y'all. <laughs> but he says, hey, he says, all hail. They, and they came and held him by, by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus to them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. I don't know about you, but for me, that's powerful. The earthquake, the stone rolled away, uh, the, the angel sitting on the stone. I always like to picture that and imagine that he's just doing this number like this. You know? He has his arm crossed like people do today. And he's just like sitting there and, and it's like for anybody that comes along, he says, what do you think about this? <laughs> what do you think about this? He, he, he's gone. He's alive. He's not there. And then not only that, in the fact, is powerful, but it's such a powerful thing that, that, that these women would actually see him with their own eyes. They would handle him. They would lay at his feet and hold on to his legs and they worshiped him. And Jesus to me, in really a celebrative type of way, he said, hey, be not afraid. There's no need to fear anymore. Be not afraid. Hey, go tell my brethren. If they'll go to Galilee, I'll, I'll meet them over there. Everything about it is powerful. Everything about it is celebrative. Everything about it is, is joyous. 
And, and so uh, it was powerful, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But let me say also that it was not only powerful, it was proven. It was proven. And back in the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, I'd say first of all, it was proven by the presence of the eyewitnesses. Verse 5 and following, and, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, and, and then of all the apostles. And so he was seen by the eyewitnesses. Uh, we could spend much time on, on, on looking at that and, and, going, and looking at the testimony of, of eyewitnesses. But understand this, it, it said over 500 saw him at one time. All the disciples saw him. James, the, the, the half-brother of Jesus, saw him. And then, not only was it proven by the presence of eyewitnesses, but his resurrection is proven by the preaching of the Apostle Paul. In the following verses, verse 8 down through verse 11, Paul writes and says, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Paul says about him on his own self, I'm not worthy to be one of his disciples, of his apostles. It's as if, it's as if I'm living, I, I come from a different time, but it's on that Damascus road in Acts chapter number nine that Jesus appeared unto Paul and, and saved him and called him to be that apostle to the Gentiles and how we ought to be so glad uh, that, that, he, that he did that. And so he goes on and says, For I am the least of the apostles, uh, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. He says, But I labored more abundantly than they all, and yet not I, but the grace of God which was in was with me. He said, It wasn't me, it was it was what God was doing with me. We know that Paul was the human writer of, of over half of the New Testament. And Paul says it wasn't me, it was God. It's of God's grace. But, but notice this, when he said in verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, myself or, or the other apostles, which, whichever one, but whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believe. I don't know about you, but I believe in the resurrection because I believe in the proof of the presence of the eyewitnesses and the proof of the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Everywhere that he went, read the book of Acts. Read his letters in the New Testament. He was always preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he never tired of giving his own testimony uh, to, of, of how Jesus appeared to him and saved him on the Damascus road. But may I go one step further and say this, his resurrection not only is proven by the eyewitnesses and by the preaching of Paul, but I believe the Bible shows us that it was proven by Jesus himself. By Jesus himself. If you were to look over to Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter 24. And, and I'll read some. Uh, I know this is going longer than, than, than we normally do. But there's just so much here. But in Luke chapter 24 verse 33. And they rose up the same hour. Now this is those that were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus appeared to them. And after they realized that it was Jesus that they were, after his resurrection, that they were in his presence, then they, they make their way back to Jerusalem to the other disciples. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. You'd have to read the previous verses to, uh, to uh, get that verse linked up with. But then in verse 36, and as they thus spake, Jesus, now you ought to underline this, Jesus himself. I just marked that in my Bible. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, saith unto them, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your, in your hearts? That word thoughts could be the word doubts. 
Why, why do thoughts of doubt arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, and, and, and I mark this in my Bible too, that it is I myself. He said, it's, it's myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. I believe we can believe in the, in the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the presence of the eyewitnesses, by the preaching of the Apostle Paul, but I believe it was also proven by Jesus himself. Over in Acts chapter number one, Luke uh, writes the book of Acts as well. And in Acts chapter number one, beginning with verse number one, he begins uh, his writing by saying, the former treatise, uh, have I made? That would be referring back to the gospel of Luke. And so he says, the former treatise have I made. You can understand the book of Acts as a continuation of the gospel according to Luke. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus, now listen to this, all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And then watch this and listen. Verse 3 of Acts chapter 1. To whom also he showed himself. That's to his disciples. To whom also he showed himself. Himself alive. After his passion. That is after his death on the cross. He showed himself alive after his passion, listen, by many infallible proofs. There's more than what you can just read in the scriptures. There, there's more proof. He says this, he showed himself by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, speaking of the, of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We have eyewitnesses. We have the preaching of the Apostle Paul. But we have the infallible proof of Jesus himself. Forty days, the Bible says, following his resurrection from the grave, he appears to his disciples. We saw in our text for today that on one occasion at least, it was over 500. There's a crowd of 500. And evidently Jesus, after his resurrection, and then his resurrected body was there in their presence, speaking to them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Folks, may I say to us this morning, he is alive. He is alive today. There's no doubt about it at all. The evidence it, it, it's, it's, it's too strong. The, the proof is, is, is so sure. Uh, the witnesses are, 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 uh, have given the evidence. You have it in the word of God. But you'll find something else out too. And that is when you come to that place in that moment, that time that you truly received Christ as your Savior and you've been born again. But you know that the witness of His resurrection doesn't stop with what we've looked at in the, in the Scriptures. There's a witness of the resurrection in your own heart. There's a witness of Jesus in our own hearts and in our own spirits. Because the Bible teaches us that He lives within us. He lives within our hearts. He lives within our lives. He gives to us new and abundant life to live for him right here and right now. And he gives us the promise of an eternal, wonderful, beautiful life in glory with him in the days ahead. And I believe with all my heart, those days are not very far away now. The day's gonna come when he's coming back for us. And he's coming back to receive us to himself that where he is there, we will be also. He's coming back that, that we should ever be with the Lord. We can meet him in the clouds, meet him in the air, and we'll be with him forever. If we have trusted him, if we have received him, 
if we have believed this gospel, listen, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And may I say to someone that may be getting this message online today, dear friend, if you don't know that you've ever been saved and, 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 and yet you're getting this message today, understand this, you never will be saved until you get a hold of this truth of his death, his burial, his resurrection. That you, you're not going to get saved by trying to become religious or doing good works. You're only going to get saved when you recognize and believe the truth of the gospel, the essence of it, death, burial, resurrection. And all who have believed and have received Jesus Christ as Savior, he has done such a change and such a wonderful work in our lives that we cannot in any form, shape, or fashion ever deny the truth of his resurrection and of his gospel. We can't do it. It's not possible. It, it's not in us. Why? Because he's in us. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together. Our heads bowed, our eyes closed for prayer. We'll pray and we'll have a song to, together. If God's spoken to your heart and you'd like to find a place around the altar during this song and, and talk to him a little bit, be sure and do that. If there's anyone here and you'd have to say, Preacher, I don't know that I've ever trusted uh, Christ as my Savior. It seems like God's been dealing with my heart and I know I've come to a time when I need to do that. Then, then I'll be over here around the front and will sure be glad to help you in any way that I can. All, all you would want to do is just come to where I'm at and we'll be sure to help you showing the Bible how to be saved and how to know it. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the Word of God. Lord, thank you for the marvelous gospel. Lord, help us to never, ever get away from the truth that the essence of it all is death, burial, resurrection. That's what you did on our behalf. That's what you accomplished. It's the message of your gospel. It's the essence of it. It's, it's, it's been proven. There's much evidence uh, to, uh, to show the truth of it. And there's even the evidence in individuals' hearts and lives of how you save them, how you change them. Lord, for that we're so grateful. We pray that you'd speak to hearts. Lord, we pray that you'd save souls. We'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. We humbly pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing together as Brother Tim leads us. Page 271. Thank you. 